When you are performing a, a piece of theatre or a, any kind of show, you are inviting the audience to come in as one set of preconceptions and to leave with a slight shift. So I grew up during the 80s in Britain. Um, you know, when Margaret Thatcher came to power, uh, it was 1979, I was only eight years old. Um, so during my sort of conscious life, there was um, an attitude towards art that was, I would say, um, growing in, in terms of materiality, in terms of market, um, which was, you know, exciting for us at the time in that the young British artists were coming to the fore, people I admired, Damien Hirst and um, Sarah Lucas and Tracy Emin and Fiona Banner, Fiona Ray. And it seemed that the attention was turning towards Britain, um, in a sense, in the art world. But I didn't feel able to follow in their footsteps when I was leaving school at 19. I had a practice, I was always drawing and painting, but I was also always making music. I was very mm. serious about my music. I, violin. I was violin, I was clarinet, I was piano, but I was really serious. I, I rehearsed late into the night. Intuitively, I didn't feel that those who were leaving school and going straight to art college were my people. I didn't feel I had the confidence to... My hair didn't look like theirs. Uh, my clothes didn't look like theirs. I didn't have the confidence to pronounce yet. Um, those, that group of people seemed to be confident in their identity, ready to uh, express themselves and pronounce and tell stories. And I wasn't. I just wasn't. I knew I needed to learn more. At that point, uh, I made a decision instead to visit a theatre design school. It wasn't that I longed to be in the theatre, just everybody kept telling me, go visit this course. And I walked in the room and I felt I was among my kind. The tribe. I found my <laughs> tribe because they were all staying up all night. <laughs> they were all reading, they were all listening to music, and they were all making things in scale models. And of course, you know, I had been, uh, like many people, bewitched by scale and models. I think most people are, but I had particularly had this experience of visiting a scale model of my town throughout my childhood, and mm. this resonated with me. Like, you're telling stories through sound and light and music and models. This is where I belong. And that took me on a sort of 20-year journey through performance. But now I emerged sort of for the, for the past six years, really wanting now to finally feel ready to, to embark on a more solo art practice. It's industrial. Uh, you know, touring music is industrial and yeah. it's industrial in its carbon footprint uh, and it's industrial in its um, systems. Mm -hmm. um, it's masculine in the way that the military can be masculine, in the way mm -hmm. that, you know, it, it is, it, it involves leaving home for long periods of time and it involves physical, you know, labour, um, yeah. putting up huge bits of steel. So there's an industriality to it, which often is at odds with the music that's being produced, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's an effect on the music of the industrial material around it and the industrial systems around it. So it's something that I'm keen to try and influence and change if I can. Mm. Um, but also I'm a mother. Um, mm. So, you know, I can't go away, you know, for too long. Okay. So I go and come back. I, I visit and I come back. The musicians that I work with primarily, um, I think they would say this about themselves too. They are kind of vessels or channels for energy between the yeah. many uh, and uh, something mm. beyond human. They, they just mm. are. Mm. Um, they channel their own experience, uh, but they also provide a conduit for the experience of others. They're sort of conductors. They're yeah. like a conductor of an orchestra, yeah, yeah, yeah. but they're conducting between the music being produced and between the emotion being produced. And they're part of a system. So if a singer sings a song, it's a song that no longer belongs just to them, but belongs to the life, the lived experience of everyone in the audience. Mm -hmm. So it's that person's wedding, it's that person's car crash, it's that person's lost child, it's that person's married child, it's that person's walk in the park, it's that person's first dance or first kiss. You know, and that's the orchestra. Mm -hmm. And they are a conductor of that. And they grow because of the mass 
uh, industrial distribution of music, you know. Um, so so they're, they're caught up in that system and it can be very, very powerful. So I learn about the power of mass communication and it makes me uh, ambitious towards uh, how other areas that I value in the arts could reach more people. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm relatively intolerant of anything that feels exclusive. Um, I don't really divide in my practice between high or low art. I genuinely um, you know, see the value uh, in areas which people might call commercial or low popular forms of art. I see them mm. honestly equally as valuable as what might, some people might call high forms or more elite forms of art. I just don't distinguish. Mm -hmm. um, so that I've learned. I think like many of us who've, you know, reached a certain point in our lives and realized the damage uh, that the quality of our lives and our systems have had on the planet, the ambition uh, and the motivation now for making any work is how can I be of any assistance? You know, what, how can my work help in any way? And obviously when you enter into the subject of climate crisis, the worry is that you are just behaving like the Ariana Grande character in Don't Look Up, if you've seen that film. Uh, she's the pop star who just sings, don't look up. I mean, that so much of what we do could be seen as just decorating the problem or, mm -hmm. um, you know, saying the problem again in a different way or, you know, making art around the problem but not really being of any assistance. So I've really tried to analyse my own set of skills. What do I have? You know, having practised for 20 odd years, what have I got that could be of any use in this emergency? Like you do in an emergency, don't you? You go, right, who can I call? Who's got the skills? Who's got a ladder? Who's got a watering can? Who's got a raft? What have I got? If someone would say to me in an emergency, what have you got? It's really the question, can I help um, with perspective shift? I think that's where I might be most useful because that's where I do have some experience. When you are performing a, a piece of theatre or a, any kind of show, you are inviting the audience to come in as one set of preconceptions and to leave with a slight shift. And you're in the privileged position that you have their attention. They are paying attention to you in a theatre for a number of hours, which is unusual with fragmented attention spans. It's like mm -hmm. a, you know, a, a nearly extinct situation mm -hmm. of undivided attention. So I think if I can get people's attention and if I can invite them to see things in a different way, literally shift their perspective. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's fraught with contradiction mm -hmm. because my own lifestyle, my own practice. Flying. <laughs> I, I travel, um, but I make adjustments wherever I can. You know, I haven't driven a car in London ever. I, you know, I have my little electric bike. I don't even get on public transport. Um, I love driving my electric bike, you know, cycling my electric bike. It's the only time I feel that I'm not in a state of contradiction because mm. I'm actually not contributing to the damage while trying to talk about it. Um, so I would like to electric bikeify all of my practice. Um, and, you know, we have a massive reforestation um, piece that we're doing, um, which you know, technically offsets all our travel, although that's a very difficult subject. Um, but, yeah, I think if I can try to enact change in each of the spheres I work in, it's really difficult. Touring rock music is an immensely mm. conservative mm. field. And we've just come off a big period of trying to change the way that we hold up a screen using yachting masts instead of heavy steel. Um, but no one's quite got the courage to go for it yet. Mm. Um, so it's a case of having to push and push and not give up. I don't feel I can leave that practice without leaving it changed. And it's a really hard thing to change, but I'm trying.